Hi, my name is Thomas Akers. Today we're going to be talking about wisdom literature. And the four books in the Bible that are wisdom literature are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. Some people would put Song of Songs in there or Song of Solomon, but it is more a book about a love letter from, let's say, God to his people or the bridegroom to the bride. Some say Solomon to one of his favorite wives. But that is also one of the books that people would consider wisdom literature too, but we're not going to be going through that today. Most all the books in the Bible have wisdom in them. Now, in the Apocrypha, which would be books that aren't really what we would consider part of the canon or part of the Bible, there's also two books. One is Ecclesiasticus, which is very similar to Ecclesiastes, but it's said a little bit differently. It's also called the Wisdom of the Son of Sirach. Also, the Book of Wisdom is another one in the Apocrypha. It's also called the Wisdom of Solomon. They're part of the Apocrypha, so they wouldn't be considered part of our canon of Scripture, but they are very good, you know, wise sayings in there that you can learn from, and they're good to read. Now, Webster's defines wisdom as the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships or insight good sense or judgment. It's a generally accepted belief, accumulated philosophical or scientific learning, knowledge. Number two would be a wise attitude, belief, or course of action. And three, the teachings of ancient wise men, which would be the book of Proverbs, let's say, or something like that. Strong's, which would be a Bible definition, or closer to a Bible definition, the word in Hebrew would be chokmah. And chokmah means wisdom, or in a good sense, skillful, wisely. Chokmah is the knowledge and ability to make the right choices at the opportune time. So it's not just knowing something, it's knowing the right time to do it. Um, prime example would be like a stoplight. You know to stop when it's red, and you see a stoplight, but Wisdom is actually stopping. So a lot of people may know that they should stop at a red light. They have that knowledge, but they're not applying that knowledge. So when you apply that knowledge, that's wisdom. So also in the Briggs Hebrew lexicon, some other definitions would be wisdom as skill in war, like knowing skillful, have the wisdom of, of war. Wisdom and administration, shrewdness, prudence, as in like religious affairs, and then ethical and religious wisdom. So there's these types of people that are talked about in the wisdom literature. And I have this little thing that I call the, the spaghetti Easterner. So you know the spaghetti Western you know what a spaghetti western is? Well, these are the spaghetti easterners. So they're the good, the bad, and the ugly. These types of people. So I want to start first with the good. The good are the righteous. The righteous people. Start out with the wise. Like wisdom, wise people have wisdom. They know right and they act accordingly. Now right, whenever I say right or wrong, it's always morally right, what's morally right, not necessarily what's right in like a physical sense. It's what morally right. So they know right and they act accordingly. Fear of the Lord. They have this fear of the Lord, the wise, because they respect his ways and what he's done, how he made the world and everything in it. And so they respect God. And the wise love righteousness. They love to do what's right. It's morally right. The just is another type of person. And they judge fair with proper standards. Those proper standards would be the Bible, or biblical standards, or God's standards. They love justice and purity. That would be the characteristic of the just. Diligent would be another type of person. They're hardworking, someone who works hard works hard at doing what's right. They're also very consistently. They consistently work hard. The last would be the humble. 
Humbled are the ones who put God and others before themselves. They evaluate people and themselves properly. So in other words, they don't think too much of themselves or too less of themselves. They think just the right amount about themselves and the same about other people. They think about them properly. The next is the bad. So we had the good and we got the bad. The bad are the wicked. There were people who are wicked. That's the other type of people. The first is the fool. The fool knows what's morally right, but does wrong anyways. They would say things like, I don't care what's right. I don't care. They have that type of mentality. The next would be the mocker or the scoffer. They actually make fun of people for doing what's morally right. What comes to mind is Saturday Night Live. Saturday Night Live is a prime example of them always making fun of people for doing what's right. They actually make fun. They think it, they like, they delight in shaming people. The next would be the sluggard. Sluggard is just somebody who's lazy. Um, slothful. Slothful means going slow. You go slow like a sloth. Or the slack hand means they don't ever try hard. The next would be, uh, part of it would be that they're a sleeper or a slumberer. They would slumber all the time. They're always sleeping and wasting time. The last person in this group of the bad is the proud. They're wise in their own eyes. They think, they think they've got it all figured out. They're really proud. They do not fear God. They're conceited or vain. Vain meaning empty. They're conceited. They think they're all that. They think they're the number one and everybody's peon below them. The last is the ugly. We had the good, we had the bad, now we got the ugly. Well, the ugly is neutral people. They could be good and they could be bad. They're neutral. So you could be rich, the first category, you could be rich and be part of the evil wicked, or you could be rich and be part of the good. You could fit in either category. They're wealthy. Typically in, in the wisdom literature, when they talk about wealthy, they're usually talking about somebody who's diligently, they worked hard to become rich. They have certain responsibilities, though, the rich. They need to help the poor and needy. So that's part of their responsibility of being rich in the wisdom literature. Now, that leads us to the poor. The poor aren't always bad, but sometimes the poor are considered bad. But God, a lot of the times in the literature, it talks about God helping the poor and coming to their aid and rescue. But it also talks about how some of them are lazy or are slackers, and that's why they're poor. The last would be the simple. The simple just means they don't know right from wrong. They don't know what's right. They don't know what is morally right. What's more, they probably don't care. Um, they lack experience, but not always uncaring, but sometimes. So how do they receive correction? When you try to correct them, what are they, what's their reaction? How do they receive it? Well, the wise, the just, the diligent, and the humble, they'll love you. They love to be corrected. It's really amazing to me when I see Christians and you try to help them and they get offended. Well, if you're truly a Christian and someone tries to correct you, you should humble yourself and take that correction and say, oh, thank you so much for helping me. Even if the person is wrong, you still take it that way and then evaluate it and then come back to them later and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to show you a verse here. Look at this. You're wrong. But always take that correction, especially if you know you're wrong. You should never be offended. The next would be the, the fool or the proud. How do they receive it when you try to correct them? They hate you. They despise you. They do not want to be corrected. They don't want you correcting them. They don't care what anybody else says. The next would be the mocker or the scoffer. They'll hate you and then they'll shame you, and then they'll make fun of you for trying to correct them. The last is a simple. They love their simplicity. Just keep it simple, stupid. Ignorance is bliss. 
I don't want to hear the truth. La, 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 don't tell me nothing. They go, I don't need to read the Bible. They say something like that. I already know what's right and wrong. I don't need to know what it says in there. I already got it all figured out. I don't need God to tell me what's right and wrong. That's the way they you know, approach those problems. They do not receive correction well at all. Just like the fool, the mocker. Now, how do you cure these things? How do you cure these people? What's the cure? Well, the wise, the just, the diligent, and the humble, they get cured by listening and learning from God, reading the Bible, praying, all those basic things. Read the Bible and pray. Read the Bible and pray. It's almost the answer to anything. Ask any question. Well, how do I do this? Read the Bible and pray. Well, how do I do that? Read the Bible and pray. Pretty much all. And you throw fasting in there, too. Fool, how does a fool learn? I'll tell you what's the cure for them is tragedy. They got to have something really bad happen in their life. Realize that they're, what they're doing, uh, that they know what's right and they're still doing wrong. Sooner or later, something bad's going to happen. Tragedy. The mocker or the scoffer, most of the wisdom literature says there's little or no hope for them. That they probably won't be cured. But if they were cured, it would probably be through tragedy. The next would be the sluggard. Well, once again, poverty, because usually lazy people are poor. That's generally true, not always true. So poverty or tragedy would, would cure them too. Proud, they need a tragedy that humbles them. That's what they need, the proud. Something that would humble them. And as simple as the last would be time, experience, and trials. So time sometimes cures the simple. If it's somebody young or something, they just don't know. As they get older, they might become wise and get experienced through trials. Some people are older and still simple. They think they have it all figured out and they know nothing. Biblical poetry. There's five books that are considered biblical poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, or Song of Solomon. Now, the last one we're not, is not included in our wisdom literature, but some people put it in there. So for some people, the wisdom literature is exactly the same as what they call the books of poetry in the Bible. So in biblical poetry, they have all these different things that I'm going to go through, but they're called parallel couplets or triplets, same or contrast, parables or fables, riddles, number sayings. All the prophetic books are poetry. So you see here this little bookcase, and you see the books of wisdom, the five books. We're not going to go through the Song of Songs, so we're not including that. But those would also be called the books of poetry, those five books. You also see the major prophets there, and then the minor prophets down below. All of these are books of poetry. They're not considered the books of poetry, but they all contain poetry. But we're discussing just the wisdom literature today. But I am going to go over this biblical poetry real quick, just because it's so applicable to the wisdom literature, because it's entirely poetry, uh, aside from the first couple chapters of Job. So the first thing you have to know about biblical poetry, it's different than what we would call poetry. It's not about rhyming you know, a sentence with another sentence, rhyming it or the rhythm of it, or anything like that. What biblical poetry is, is what they have is these parallels. Are they have parallel couplets or parallel triplets? And they say the same thing in the second sentence as it would the first, but just saying it in a little bit different way. So the meaning is almost identical, but they're just saying it in a little bit different way. So I'll give you an example here. This is Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. So the first part of it, trust in the Lord with all thine heart, is almost the same as lean not to thy own understanding. Then the next verse would be, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. So in all thy ways acknowledge him is almost the same as he shall direct thy paths. And you'll find this type of poetry all the way through all those books that I just showed you, through the wisdom literature, the, the major prophets, the minor prophets. You also find it in some of the other books too, but those are almost entirely 
done in that type of poetry where they say a line and then the next line is almost the same. Sometimes they'll say it in triplets, so it'll be three lines, but uh, and they'll say the same thing like three times in a row. So the next thing would be a parallel couplet, which is in contrast. So they say something and then they say something opposite of it. So it's the same thing in poetry. It's a parallel, but it's a contrast parallel. So I'll give you an example in Proverbs 12, 22. Lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are his delight. So the liar and then the true. So they're showing that contrast between the two. Verse 23 is another parallel couplet in contrast. It says, A prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaimeth foolishness. So you can see the prudent in contrast to the foolish. So another type of biblical poetry is parables. And there's two different things, a parable and a fable. Now, parables and fables are not the same. And the reason why is because a parable is something that could be true to life, but they're using it in like a story type format in order for you to learn some example in life. Fable would be the same thing, except a fable would be something that couldn't be true to life at all. It's using situations and things, putting inanimate objects as, you know, lifelike. Well, here's an example of a parable in Luke 15. Jesus is speaking and says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? Now, a fable in, is different than that. And you can see that parable it has something that's real. A man could have a hundred sheep and go after a sheep. So it is a true life situation. He's giving it as an example to learn something, but here would be a fable. A fable would be here in Judges 9, 8. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, reign thou over us. So this is obviously a fable. It's not a real to life situation but it's another example of biblical poetry. Also in biblical poetry, one of the things that's used is riddles. In Judges 14, 13, this is Samson saying a riddle to these people, and it's also poetry. Out of the eater came forth meat, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. So it would be their job to figure out this riddle, but it's also biblical poetry. Another example of biblical poetry would be number sayings. Number sayers list things out. I'll give you an example here. This is in Proverbs 30, 18, and it says, There be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not, the way of an eagle in the air, the way of a serpent upon a rock, the way of a ship in the midst of the sea, the way of a man with a maid. So you can see he says there's three, oh yay, May, maybe there's four. So he's listing these things, doesn't mean it's an exhaustive list, it's just a list of things to show some sort of biblical poetry and biblical proverb. First I'd like to talk about the book of Job. It's the first book of wisdom. And the story of Job goes something like this. Job was very prosperous. He had thousands of animals. He had a huge house with a household filled with servants. He had a lot of children. He was very prosperous. And he loved the Lord, and he was upright in all of his ways, and perfect in all of his ways is how the Bible lists. And his sons and daughters they would go out and feast and have these huge feasts and they would drink and eat. And Job was concerned that possibly they might be sinning. So he would give these daily sacrifices to God to protect his children. And one day the sons of God, well, which are all the angels, went up to see God or went to see God and Satan went with them. And God said to Satan, he goes, have you considered my servant Job? He's upright and perfect in all of his ways. 
And Satan said, yeah, yeah, he's, he's upright and perfect, but you put this hedge about him. In other words, you're protecting him. You've given him all this perfect stuff. He's got the wonderful life. If you take that away, he'll curse you and, and die. Actually, what he says, he says, he'll curse you to your, your face. So God said, okay, I'll let you. You go ahead and take away all of his stuff, but don't touch Job. You can take away all of his stuff, but you can't take, touch Job. So Satan did. He went down and he, he used, you know, uh, other nations and stuff to take away all of his uh, livestock. Then the actual, uh, you know, nature to destroy his stuff and destroy his house, killed his children. Um, all of his servants, they all died. So all but one, one servant came back and told Job, he said, you lost everything. Your children, your livestock, your house, everything was destroyed. And Job was really good about this. He took this very well. He said, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So with all of that, Job did not curse God. He still loved the Lord. So Satan came back up to see God. And God said, have you considered my servant Job? Look what he, all of you done to him. And still he loves me. He said, blessed be the name of the Lord. So Satan said, skin for skin. So in other words, yeah, he may do that because of all of your, his stuff is gone. But if you, if you go after him, if you go after Job and you hurt him, boy, he'll curse you right to your face. So once again, God said, okay, you go ahead. You can do what you want to Job, but don't take his life. So Satan went down immediately and put boils all over Job, all over his whole body, head to toe. So Job's wife came to him. So believe it or not, Job's wife wasn't one of the ones that died. And she came to him and said, Job, why don't you curse God and die? So Job looked at her and said, you foolish woman, I will never curse God. So even through his pain, he still wouldn't curse God. So then came Job's three friends, and they all came out to see him. And they sat with him for seven days in silence. That's some good friends. They came from a long distance, and they came with him and sat with him in silence, didn't say anything, just feeling bad for him. Finally, Job says something. And he gives the first part of what they go into these three different cycles of debates. And he starts speaking how he did nothing wrong. He doesn't understand. He's basically saying, why, God, why did you do this to me? Why did this happen to me? Because he knew he was doing everything right. So his friends go back and forth with him, each friend trading off. And then Job would say something, and then one of her friends would say something. And basically, the friends were just saying things that were truths in some respects, but not really very timely. In other words, when somebody's going through that, they probably wouldn't want to hear that stuff. But anyways, they go through all that, and it goes through three cycles of that. And Job's saying, why, God? And he would, he would also uh, rebuttal with them, whatever they'd say. You must, if they said, you must have did this, he'd say, no, I didn't do that. Finally, Elihu, another man, enters. He's a young man, and he gives four speeches. He's young where all the other men are old. Job's older, and the other men are all older, all his other friends. So Elihu gives four speeches, and these are what most people consider all very good speeches and truths. Um, then God speaks in the last few chapters, about three chapters, not right before the end. And uh, his also most certainly be considered all truths, the, the words that God speaks. 
Then at the end, uh, God tells him, Job, you don't know what you're talking about and some of the things he said. So we know that some of the things within the book of Job, that Job's speeches, we know that those weren't quite right. He does all, he also says, God also condemns the, the three friends saying that they shouldn't have said some of the things they said and they were wrong and they should repent of them. So Job repents in the end of the things he said and God blesses him more so than he was blessed to begin with. So that's basically the end of Job, and that's basically an overview of Job. When you know the basic idea and outline of the book of Job, it's a little easier to understand how it all works, because some of those things you listen to and say, well, this almost seem like contradictions to other parts of the Bible. And the reason being is because all those things they're saying aren't necessarily true, because they're um, things they're saying, Job is saying, and that his three friends are saying, aren't necessarily truths. So in Job, there's two types of writing. One is prose, and the other one would be poetry. Most all of the book of Job is poetry, but the first two chapters have prose. Prose is just meaning not poetry. Here's an example, and you can see in the, the modern versions of the Bible, they typeset it differently. They indent it a little bit, it's indented, and it's also italicized. So I put it in white here to show the poetry, where the black would be the prose, or just narrative. In Job 121, it says, And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. So you can see that the, the prose is like a narrative where the poetry is written in a, this italicized manner in the modern versions. And the regular King James version doesn't do that. It's all written the same. It would all be the same color, too, in all versions. I just did it in white so you could see it clearly. So the authorship and the time of writing of Job, but first of the authorship, most people believe it was written by Job, except for the last part of the last chapter. It would be written by Elihu. You know, talking about him dying, obviously. Somebody had to write that afterwards. Uh, some believe it was written by Moses, some of the church fathers. Some people believe it was written by Solomon. Martin Luther happened to be one of them. And then some of the modern, more liberal scholars believe it was written by Jeremiah. Um, I tend to stand with the first that was written by Job, and Elihu wrote the last chapter. So the setting of it, it was in the patriarchal period, some around 2000 to 1800 BC. His wealth was measured in livestock. So that's a prime example of something. Back at that time, that's the way they measured. They didn't use money. The Chaldeans, or the Babylonians, weren't settled yet. They are nomadic raiders. You can see that in those verses. It was sometime after Abraham and after Esau, but before the Exodus. It's because there was no Levitical priesthood yet. So we know basically the time frame of Job just by those things. The location was in the east in a land of Uz. I believe that's in the area called Damascus. His friends were in Edom. Some people believe that it was written in Edom too. See on this map, kingdom of Damascus is up in the blue, up at the top in the north, and then Edom's in the south. I believe that Job was in Damascus area. I think believe the land of Uz was up there. Some believe it was down in Edom, but they said that they traveled a long distance as friends to get to him. I, and there's some other reasons. I don't want to get into that right now, but his friends most certainly were from Edom and possibly him too. So why does Job serve God? Why does Job suffer? Now, there's some reasons that are rejected by the book of Job. One is dualism. There's some religions out there that believe in dualism. Dualism is when like, or good and evil are equal in power to each other. So God and Satan would be equal in dualism. Yin and yang are equal. You know, good is equal to uh, bad. There's other religions, too, that believe that, that good and equal are a struggle or a fight. Well, the book of Job very clearly shows that God has Satan on a leash. God is in control of Satan. He lets him do whatever he wants to let him do. And God, Satan can't do anything without God letting him. That's why you know, he talks about having him, uh, you know, Job, a hedge about him. 
In other words, God's made it so that Satan can't do certain things. Another thing is original sin, that no man is really righteous. You can see that clearly in the book of Job. Then there's some reasons suggested by the book of Job for these things too. Why does Job serve God and why does Job suffer? The first is the role of affliction as a test of faith and loyalty. So in other words, we're here on earth as a test. I believe this is part of the meaning of life. I'll get into that a little bit more later. But it's as a test. That's why we're here. That's why the tree was put in the Garden of Eden. And there's more. I've got a whole video about the meaning of life. Also, that this is the role of suffering is for character formation. In other words, somebody's spoiled and they got everything they want. They don't have good character. They tend not to have good character. Also, suffering is the price a righteous man pays for some higher good or the glory of God. So in other words, that's what some people call penance. Humble themselves with sackcloth and ashes. So they put on sackcloth. It makes you scratchy to the skin and they sit in the ashes and things like that. So it's some sort of like bringing you low to bring God up for the glory of God. In James 5, 10, and 11, it talks about the patience of Job. And that's one of the things we've learned from the book of Job, that Job had patience. So it's one of the truths that comes through it all, that he waited on God for God's timing, not his timing. But he loved the Lord, and blessed be the name of the Lord, regardless of what happened. So God rewarded him for it. But this is Job 28. Surely there is a vein for the silver and a place for gold where they find it. Iron is taken out of the earth and brass is molten out of the stone. He setteth an end to darkness and searcheth out all perfection, the stones of darkness and the shadow of death. The flood breaketh out from the inhabitant, even the waters forgotten of the foot. They are dried up. They are gone away from men. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread and under it is turned up as it were fire. The stones of it are the place of sapphire, and it hath dust of gold. There is a path which no fowl knoweth, which the vulture's eye hath not seen, and the lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock, he overturneth the mountains by the roots. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. Whence then cometh wisdom? And where is the place of understanding? Seeing it is hid from the eyes of all living and kept close from the fowls of the air. Destruction and death say, We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. For he looketh to the ends of the earth and seeth under the whole heaven to make the weight of the winds. And he weigheth the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain, and a way for the lightning of the thunder. Then did he see it, and declare it. He prepared it, yea, and searched it out. And unto man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Next I want to talk about the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is the biggest book in the Bible, and I really feel privileged to be able to talk about it today. If you open up your Bible to the middle, you're going to hit some sort of wisdom literature, whether it be Psalms, Job, Proverbs, something that's all right about in the middle there. So, Well, the name and the nature of it, first is the Hebrew name means book of praises. The Greek name means poems to be accompanied by a stringed instrument. So basically it's songs. Psalms means songs. It's words put to music, and they're sung. So it consists of prayers, praises, historical recollections, soliloquies, and prophecies. 
So the, these musical notations that are listed throughout Psalms, I'm going to go just through a few of them. I don't want to talk about them too much. The first one is Salah. You'll see Salah is listed 71 times in 39 Psalms. Now the meaning is unknown, but it may be a musical rest, like a break, like a stopping of the music. It also could be a change in volume, meaning, okay, now the next part is going to be a louder volume. The other thing it could be is that it's just instrumentation only, or only just instruments, and the vocals stop. Uh, that's what I believe it is. There's a lot of different people who have different interpretations of why that is. So I can just imagine David out there with this harp just jamming through these Salah moments. He'd be out there jamming just like a lead guitarist doing all the poses. Other thing you'll see a lot in there is this to the chief musician. And that's also a word that's been translated. You also see the Neganoth, which is a, some sort of stringed instrument probably. There's some other ones that are unknown. That Neklanoth means with wind instruments or with a reed pipe. And then the last one meaning sickness or grief. So the authorship of Psalms. There's a whole bunch of authors in the book of Psalms. So we've got to go through those. First of all, there's 50 anonymous Psalms. And I have them listed there for you. You can see all those. There's 73 that are attributed to David. Um, there's two of them, Psalms 2 and 95, which in the New Testament, it shows that he wrote those as well, that David, so that makes 75 total for David. There's two Psalms written by Solomon. There's one by Moses, uh, a bunch by Asaph, some by the sons of Korah. And then Jaduthan, he wrote some. Ethan the Ezraite wrote one, and He-Man the Ezraite. He-Man sounds like a cartoon, doesn't it? <laughs> He-Man. So there's various types of Psalms. The first are the Messianic Psalms. The Messianic Psalms are Psalms about Christ. You see, I have them listed here. The ones with the little asterisks by them are about the kingdom. They're the four great kingdom Psalms. Um, the Psalms 2... 45, 72, and 110. Now, in all of these Messianic Psalms that are all about Jesus Christ, they have different titles for them. Sometimes they'll call him the Anointed. Sometimes they'll call him the King. Sometimes they'll call him Melchizedek Priest, uh, the Rejected Stone, sometimes God, and sometimes my Lord, and sometimes the Son or the Firstborn. The next type of Psalms would be the penitential psalms. Penitential meaning bowing or humbling yourself to God. Or another thing that would be really to a penitential song would be like you know, some sort of going through some sort of suffering. And, but through pen, penitence, which is typically lowering yourself. The next is the imprecatory psalms. Imprecatory means curse. It's a psalm that's cursing. So when David or the writer is cursing these people that are doing evil to him or God, mostly to God, that's why these are done. You'll see Psalms 137 is one of the really, he's really some harsh curses and 140 as well. But all of them have curses in them. Next would be historical Psalms, which is pretty self-explanatory. They're things that happened prior the next would be Psalms of Degrees, and those are listed too. You'll see Psalms of Degrees when you're going through the book of Psalms. It's, it shows it there. Well, these are ascents, so it's ascending. So a lot of people think ascending means going up. Uh, a lot of people believe this has to do with the dynamics of the music. It becomes louder. So as it's going up, as you're singing the psalm, it would go louder and louder and more dynamic. Some also believe that this represents, because there's 15 of these psalms of degree, that it's the 15 steps, and that's a tradition too, that, that for each step between the steps in the temple, these 15 steps, that they would sing a psalm. So they go up one step, sing a psalm, go up the next step, sing another psalm. The last is the Hallel. Hallel is like hallelujah, means praise. So these are the praise psalms. And there's the one that's the great Hallel, which would be Psalms 136. So the great praise. The psalms are divided into five books. 
each ending with a doxology. And you can see I have them all listed in your book one, book two, book three, book four, five. And each one has these certain chapters. So at the end of, like, let's say, chapter 41, there'd be a doxology. At the end of chapter 72, there'd be a doxology. At the end of chapter 89, there'd be a doxology. So a doxology is basically like a blessing on God, and then it usually ends with amen. Example would be in chapter 89, verse 52. This is the end of the chapter. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. So you can see it's like a blessing to God. And a lot of books in the Bible end with like a blessing like this and then amen at the end. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So he's talking about the grace of God and then be with you all. Amen. So it's some, that would be a prime example of another doxology. So they're at the end of each of these five books. It's just something to be noteworthy of. See here listed on the left on the bottom I have who wrote them. Like the first book one is mostly Davidic, mostly written by David. Book two, mostly by David. Book three is mostly by Asaph. Book four is mostly anonymous. And then book five is both David and anonymous. So another thing that's in the book of Psalms would be acrostics. Acrostic is when something is spells something out going down, but then across it says, you know, words or a sentence. So you see this here on the left, it's Jesus. So Jesus, name above every name, everlasting Father, Son of God, undefiled High Priest, and Savior. So reading down it reads Jesus, but reading across it says all these other things. See another example I have for Christmas on the right. Psalms 9, 10, 25, 34, 37, 111, 112, 119, and 145 are all acrostics. Most all of them are using the letters of the alphabet. So there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So Psalms 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible, every verse within each section, and there's 22 sections, so every verse in each section, say like a section has 10 verses, everyone would start with an A, the first one. They would all start with an A. This next section, would, they would all start with a B, and so on, C, D. So all the verses in that section. Now, this doesn't work in English. All these acrostics, you're not going to find them in English because it's all done in Hebrew. So when they translated the Bible, they thought it would be more important to be word-for-word -word translation than to uphold these acrostics. Now, there are some versions of the Bible that do the acrostics, but then they wouldn't be word-for-word -word translations. And there's other translations out there that do it that way. But typically, in our Bibles, they're not done that way. So you would, you would see it, it wouldn't be acrostics in the English, only in the Hebrew. Proverbs 31 is another example of an acrostic. They're all over. There's a lot of acrostics in the Bible. Lamentations, every chapter is written acrostic. All the chapters have 22 verses, except one, which has 66. So it goes through all the letters of the alphabet three times in that one chapter, which is 66 verses. All the other chapters, it would go A through Z. In Hebrew, they don't have A through Z, but they have different letters. But they have 22 letters, and it goes through all. So the first verse would start with A, second verse would start with B, and so on. Go through all. Lamentations does that all the way through it. So next is parables and dark sayings. Psalms 49, 4 says, I will incline my ear to a parable. I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Psalm 78, 2 says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. So these parables and dark sayings are very close to each other. They're almost the same thing. But a dark saying also is like a metaphoric language. So they're using metaphors to make things more clear. So it's using metaphors and parables and fables, and all these different types of forms of literature, of poetry, and wisdom to create this wisdom literature, which is Psalms as part of it. But it's also songs. It's also done in music. So you can see, as I open my dark saying upon the harp. But Psalm 78 too, I want to talk about this because this is echoed in, in Matthew. And Matthew 13, 34 says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them, 
that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter these things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So you could see that Jesus was using the exact same type of words and methods of these dark sayings and proverbs to communicate these ideas. And that's the beauty of using a, a parable. A parable gives you visual pictures of something and it's hard to misinterpret it when you change from one language to another when it's, when it's, uh, when it's um, translated from one language to another. It's hard to get that idea wrong. You may miss a word in the translation here or there, but the idea transcends through and it comes through because it's an idea through a parable and examples. I'm now going to read through Psalms 1. I memorized this as a kid, so it's fun to read through this. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor the sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So you can see that he's using some of these like trees, you know, comparing people to trees and the sinners to chaff. Chaff is a part of the wheat. When they'd beat the wheat on top of the, on the ground, the chaff would, they would sort it out because the chaff is lighter and the wheat would uh, strain through. So they would blow the wind, they'd fan it, and then the chaff would blow away and the wheat would just remain. So he's comparing people to these, which would be like fables. But they're also proverbs and they're also part of the wisdom literature. So next I want to talk about the book of Proverbs. And the book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. It is entirely about wisdom. It even says in the first few verses of it, that that's what it's going to be talking about. And that's what's so important is wisdom. And in the book of Proverbs, we'll see all of the different types of poetry used, all the different ones I've already discussed earlier, all the different types of people that I discussed earlier, you know, in the good, bad, and the ugly, all of those discussed in there. These will all be encountered in the book of Proverbs. So knowing those is very good when you go into the book of Proverbs, knowing how to approach it. And when you see those type of people, you know, the, the spaghetti Easterners, you'll know what they are when you get into the book of Proverbs, who they are and why it uses them in that way. So a proverb is an epigram or byword. Proverbs is a collection of moral sayings and counsels forming a book. A byword is something to go by. It's, it's a, one that is noteworthy, something, a word that is noteworthy. An epigram is a concise poem dealing poignantly. Proverbial. Proverbials of, relating to, or resembling a proverb or byword. It's something that's commonly spoken. An example of something that's proverbial would be, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So you hear that all the time. And it's something that's become a proverb well known by a lot of people, even currently in our day and age. Proverbs are not necessarily truth. This is something you've got to keep in mind when you're reading Proverbs. These are generalizations. In other words, for the most part, this is what happens if you follow this. So and if you're diligent, for the most part, you will be rich. The authorship of Proverbs it was written by Solomon in 930 BC or somewhere around that time. Now it says in 1 Kings 4.32 that Solomon spoke 3,000 Proverbs, but only 800 of those are written in Proverbs. Also it says in 1 Kings 4.32 that he also wrote 
already spoke, a thousand and five songs. So Solomon also did that, which is amazing. Now, some of the Proverbs that are written in Proverbs are not written by Solomon, but they're collected by him. And that's what the tradition says, and most people believe that. So there's a division, basically, I've shown here. I'm not going to go over it too much. But you can see the Proverbs 1 through 9, 10 through 22. And then you see down the list how these are basically divided up. So you can look at that on your own time. just want to give you a basic idea of how it's broken up there. Obviously, ending with the Proverbs 31 woman. It's all about what would be a, a good woman, a strong, uh, wonderful woman, a wise woman. What she acts like in Proverbs 31. That's why they even have the saying, she's a Proverbs 31 woman, which means she's very good and wise. So I'm going to read, starting with chapter 2, and read some of Proverbs to give you an idea of what they kind of sound like and how they go, how the, the temperament of the poetry. My son, if thou wilt, receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge, and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver, and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt understand the fear of the Lord, and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. My son, forget not my law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now these are some really popular verses right here. So I have to talk a little bit about Proverbs 3, 5, which is trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. As a child, I used to go to my mother and ask her things about the Bible or about God. And sometimes she didn't know the answer. So she'd say, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. This is a, an abuse of this scripture. That is not what this scripture means at all. This, this means that with God, he will give you understanding. But it's not your, your, what you want. It's not with y what you are leaning on yourself. You're leaning on God to get understanding. It's going to be very clear when we get to verse 13. It's even more so that trust in the Lord with all thine heart. So if you trust him and you don't lean on your own understanding, then you will get wisdom. But it will come to you. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel and marrow to thy bones. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. See there, it shows you that you will get the wisdom that it's not just wisdom that the Lord has. He gives it to you. Matter of fact, we are made in God's image. So a lot of the wisdom is something we get naturally. So we can find wisdom if we look for it, if we're looking for it, especially in the right places. For the merchandise of it is better than the merchandise of silver and the gain thereof than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. Length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and her paths are peace. 
She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So you can see in the verses 16 and 17 and 18, you can see these that there's this idea that they're putting um, her. It's talking about wisdom like a, a woman. So, and she is the tree of life. So it's actually making two, like, multiple things that are almost fable-like. So giving these metaphoric language to compare wisdom to a woman. And this goes on throughout all of the books of prophecy and the books of wisdom, the books of poetry. They use this type of imagery all the time. So you have to be very, you know, conscientious of that and see how that works. And the last part, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is something that's not being like afraid. It's more like being respectful and fearing, knowing he is so great and the greatness of the Lord. So that's what the fear of the Lord is in short. There's much more to it than that, but that's what that is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the holy, holy means being set apart, and God would be setting, being set apart, is understanding. It means he's something to be relished. Next, we're going to talk about Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. So the meaning of the title, Ecclesiastes, in the Greek translation of the Hebrew title, is one who gathers and addresses an assembly, or the preacher. So the tradition of the Jews is that Solomon wrote it, and there's internal evidence in the book that shows that. You see those verses that I show you there. It's similar to Proverbs in a lot of ways, but it's a little more gloomy or pessimistic, showing, and I'll get more into that in a little bit, but Solomon was old when he wrote it, and you can see that in chapter 12. So it's at the end of his life. You can see in 1 Kings chapter 11, that Solomon departed from God. Well, we believe that was earlier in his life. So at the end, you'll see that Solomon repents from his backsliding in chapter 12. And you can kind of see how that wording is. It shows that Solomon did come back to God. So that's what I believe that Solomon did. And that he would be with us in eternity. Some key terms are vanity of vanities. And vanity means emptiness or meaningless. So all is vanity. So vanity of vanity is all is vanity is said 31 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes 1-2 says it. It goes, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. The NIV would translate that all is vanity as everything is meaningless. Well, we know this is a self-defeating statement. If everything is empty and everything is meaningless, it's self-defeating. That means the statement is meaningless. That means everything would be meaningless. So just like saying there is no truth, it cannot be true. It defeats itself. It's self-refuting. It's a self-refuting statement. So we know that there must be some implication of something else going on here because God does not write things that's self-defeating, nor does the wisest man ever, Solomon. Well, besides Jesus, Jesus was wiser than Solomon. He even said it. Um, would say something that was self-defeating. So we know there's more implication to this. And we know that too because no one would say everything is meaningless and then go on to say, well, you know, a whole bunch of chapters of stuff. It would be a waste of time. So there's an implication that all is meaningless without God or the supernatural or love. Everything would be meaningless without those. So nine times it says grasping for the wind. Grasping for the wind would be something that's impossible. You could, you'd be grasping and grabbing at the wind, but you can't catch the wind. You can't... Um, it's like a waste of your time to even try to do that. And that's one of the, the themes within the book. All is vanity. Another thing it says quite a bit is under the sun. 
it says that 28 times. Well, under the sun means everything happening here on earth or the, in the natural, that's the way I would put it, or in this something other than the supernatural, something other, so, something other than the spirit world or the soul part of you. So it's happening in this world it's of your five senses, what you see, hear, taste, smell, feel. Those five senses be predominantly in those. Atheists would probably put this like what all there is. That's why atheists have a gloomy picture to what meaning about what the meaning or meaning of life because they don't believe in those things outside of just what's in the natural. They don't they have no belief whatsoever in the supernatural. So I'm going to read Ecclesiastes chapter 7 starting at verse 11. Wisdom is good with an inheritance, and by it there is profit to them that see the sun. For wisdom is a defense, and the money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. This is chapter 12, starting at verse 8. Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd, that one shepherd being God, and further by these, my son, be admonished, and making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So you can see in the book of Ecclesiastes, it has some contrast or some things that seem like they're almost a contradiction to the book of Proverbs. And they are because the implication of without God. In other words, some of these verses, when you're reading it, it's going to seem like it's a complete contradiction to the book of Proverbs. Well, it's meaning that these things are such without God, where that implication doesn't exist in the book of Proverbs. So you'll see as you go through it. There's also some really great things. You may remember the song, there's a time for war, time for peace, time for all these things under the sun. Once again, under the sun. It's all in this world. In the natural, there's a time for all these things. When we go to the supernatural, they won't need these things anymore. They'll be gone. They'll be put to, uh, they'll be destroyed by God in the book of Revelation. All death, all this world, uh, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth. These will all be destroyed. But one of the things I wanted to show you about this, everything being under the sun, it fits so much to like what an atheist would say. Almost when you read certain parts of the book of Ecclesiastes, it's almost like things that an atheist would say. Like, because um, an atheist doesn't believe in the spirit or the soul. They believe that emotions and free will are just an illusion. They're not real. So they would say there is everything that's under the sun is all there is. Only the stuff in the natural, there's no supernatural. So they have really no basis for any sort of standard. Now, atheists do know right from wrong, and they would even say that they accept love, but they see it as a construct of the mind rather than something that actually exists. They don't believe that there's actually something like love. They believe that's just an illusion or a construct of the mind. So with that, you cannot establish a standard. If there's no such thing as love, if there's no such thing as free will, if you don't have free will to choose, why would you put anyone in jail? Why would you say something's right or wrong? 
Well, you can't. Everything just is. If somebody goes out and kills people, it's not his fault. That's just the way he is. It's not his fault. Why would you put him in jail for it? That's the problem without having a standard, without having God as a standard, having Bible, the Word of God as a standard. If you don't have that, there's no reason to say that Adolf Hitler was wrong and Mother Teresa was right. You cannot say that if you don't have a standard, something outside of us, just what we think is right or wrong. They, we know what's right and wrong, but you don't have a basis for a standard. It could be a constantly changing standard. Some may say it's okay now to do something that wasn't before. And they constantly are trying to move these lines and blur the lines with atheism. Now, when Jesus came, he changed everything because he made sure that you knew the most important commandment, which is what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second, to love your neighbor as yourself. So love was the most important thing. This relationship with God is the most important thing. Keeping his commandments, and all those are still what like Job or uh, Ecclesiastes is ending with here, and also Proverbs. All these things are echoed to keep the commandments of God. Fear the Lord. But the relationship, that love relationship, Jesus really made that clear, is a true meaning of life. I'll just summarize it really quickly here. But it's a test to see who loves and has a relationship with Christ God. That's why we're here. That's the meaning of life. That's the summation of it all. Without love, if love is just an illusion, you cannot have a relationship like that. That's all fake. It's just, it's just a construct of the mind. It doesn't really exist. It's just an illusion. But we know that love is real. We know that we have free will to choose I hope you enjoyed this teaching I did on wisdom literature. My name is Thomas Akers. Have a blessed day.